Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's EPIC conference. Um, the session today is on mobility and transportation. My name is uh, Marla Beauchamp. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Rehabilitation Science at McMaster University, and I'm a Canada Research Chair in Mobility, Aging, and Chronic Disease. Um, and so I do research focused on improving mobility in older adults and uh, lead one of the core research programs for AgeWell um, on uh, mobility monitoring using smartwatch technology in older, in older people. So as your moderator today, I'm really thrilled to join the conversation with our presenters from the AgeWell challenge area, which, which is focused on mobility and transportation. And this challenge area um, focuses on optimizing mobility um, to meet the needs of older adults, both in their homes and within the community. Um, and ultimately, uh, the, the goal in this is to uh, facilitate uh, important health outcomes, including social participation and quality of life. So I'm excited to hear from our three different presenters today. We've had a slight uh, change in our program. Unfortunately, one of our presenters was unable to make it. Um, but we do have Changi Kim here from the University of British Columbia, Erica Dove from the University of Toronto, who will co-present with Olive Bryanton uh, from an older adult and caregiver advisory committee. Um, and we also have a demo from Braze Mobility, um, which will be our third presentation today. So some general housekeeping before we get started, just want to remind you um, the EPIC conference is running for 10 days and we have five days left. Challenge area presentations will continue to take place on Crowdcast from 1 to 2.30 on Monday to Thursday this week. Our French partners are hosting sessions on June 7th and 9th from 12 to 1 p.m. On Friday, June 10th, our partner, the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging, Mira, is hosting um, a panel called Bridging the Digital Divide, Equity in Aging, Health and Technology, followed by a Star Institute panel, Get Published. And finally, the EPIC conference uh, closing will end the week. I encourage you to check out the AgeWell EPIC conference webpage for additional details and registration information. So as I said, today's session will have three presentations and then we'll have a five minute Q&A um, following each presentation and then a general Q&A session um, so that we can um, have a larger discussion. All attendees are encouraged to use the ask a question box uh, to ask questions and leave a comment on a question and you can also up, upvote questions that others have submitted. Uh, and this session is being recorded and will be available for playback. Links to playback will be on, on Crowdcast and on the EPIC conference website. So I'll start by introducing our first presenter, Changi Kim from the University of British Columbia. Changi is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. He received a BS degree in information technology in South Korea and his PhD degree in biobehavioral science at the University of Florida. His research goal is to develop improved rehabilitation intervention protocols for addressing motor impairments of older adults and disease populations. His previous research focused on uh, neuromuscular mechanisms of impaired motor control using EMG, and his current projects focus on understanding the effects of sensory stimulation on motor function in various clinical populations. His research will provide essential knowledge for developing portable vibrotactile devices and for enhancing activities of daily living. So welcome, Changi. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me today. So should I start the presentation? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, hold on for a second. Can you guys see the screen? Yes. Okay. So, all right. So first of all, thank you for having me today. And as I was introduced, uh, my name is Chen Ki Kim, a postdoc of uh, the U at UBCO. And the title of today's presentation is Effect of Imperceptible Vibration, Sensory Motor Function in Person with Diabetes Neuropathy. 
since the data collection is still ongoing, uh, this presentation will be focused on the research protocol plus the partial data. So number of people with diabetes are rapidly increasing in Canada. Uh, according to the statistic in uh, Statistic Canada, uh, in 2018, there are 3.4 million people who live with diabetes. But the actual number of people who live with diabetes are estimated to go above like 5.3 million in 2021, including the people who do not know they have diabetes. And that is approximately over 10% of the Canadian population. And the Canadian healthcare system uh, spends like $16.9 billion annually. Uh, to deal with this type of disease. So, and uh, so these two numbers are keep increasing rapidly as every year. So diabetes indeed has a high implication for both society and individuals uh, in Canada. And the diabetes is age-related disease, uh, which means older adults are more vulnerable to this type of disease. As you can see on the graph on the right, uh, the prevalence, uh, diabetes prevalence over the age of 70s are close to 30%, which means one out of three uh, older adults uh, live with diabetes. So all these numbers are telling us that we need more attention on diabetes. So the diabetes itself is a big issue. However, the bigger problem comes from the lot of complication of the diabetes. Diabetes neuropathy is something that I am focusing. And according to the national data, uh, at least 50% 50 uh, 50 of the people who has diabetes will eventually have uh, some sort of uh, a certain type of diabetes neuropathy in 10 years after they di their diagnosed diabetes. However, the, this time duration is much shorter in older adults. So what is diabetes neuropathy? So high blood glucose level in diabetes patient, it reduces the blood circulation in our body and it affects our nerve and it induces damages in nerve and it causes sensation loss and increase the pain. So that's what the diabetes neuropathy is. And unfortunately, there is no cure for right now at the moment for the diabetes neuropathy, except strictly controlling uh, the blood glucose level so that the symptom doesn't get worse. And thus far, the clinical treatment has been only focused on dealing with the pain, but not on the sensation improvement. That is another issue because the sensation loss compromises the mobility by decreasing the balance or the decreasing the walk walking space, and it also increased the risk of fall. So. Enhancing sensation is critical in diabetes neuropathy patient. So in this project, I applied a very specific type of sensation stimulation that are known to improve the mobility by improving the sensation in other clinical population. So what is that, uh, the stimulation? Uh, that might be the question you may have imperceptible vibration is known to improve sensory motor function in hand of stroke patient and older adults. So imperceptible vibration is a simple and novel technology uh, which showed its effect in various populations as I already said and the imperceptible vibration means the vibration that you cannot feel it is under your vibration sensation threshold. Uh, these two uh, studies, including many others, uh, already show that the, the sub-threshold vibration uh, uh, 
improve the sensation like a monofilament test score and it also increased the grip strength and it also improves the hand dexterity. So uh, in my project, this type of vibration was applied to see its effect on foot of diabetes neuropathy patient. So the objective of this project was to determine the efficacy of imperceptible vibration on enhancing sensation and motor function of the fit in middle-aged and older adults with diabetes neuropathy. So the two research questions we build up from this objectives are whether there is an option optimal vibration location and intensity that can maximize the sensation improvement or enhancement, and whether the optimal vibration improve both sensation and motor function in diabetes neuropathy group. So the research design of the experiment one, the goal of the experimental one was uh, the, to find an optimal vibration location and intensity that can maximize, that maximize the sensation enhancement in diabetes neuropathy. To, uh, and to fulfill this goal, the 20 diabetes neuropathy uh, patient age above 50s and 20 uh, age and sex match the healthy control uh, will perform um, two different sensation measurements. One is the monofilament test, which measures the minimum pressure that one can feel on five different foot areas, and two point discrimination on a four different uh, area on foot. Uh, and the two point discrimination test, there is a two pin and di differentiating the distance. And we were measuring the, the minimum distance between two pins that the participant could distinguish. And in this experiment one, there were 13 different vibration condition. Obviously no vibration was the baseline and the vibration using this small coin sized vibrator was placed on the four different foot area, one plantar and dorsal and one ankle and uh, soleus or gastrocnemius muscle away from foot. And in this four different area, the different uh, vibration intensity were applied while we are measuring this two sensation measurement, 40, 60 and 80 percent. So, so these these were the experimental setup. And as I already mentioned, the data collection is still ongoing. So this research that I'm going to share uh, with you today is a research from the three diabetes neuropathy patient and four control subjects. The blue is the diabetes neuropathy patient and the orange color is the control subject. Uh, and I am going to share the research from the monofilament test only today. So when you see the very last graph, it is uh, showing the, the monofilament baseline when no vibration was applied. It is clearly showing that the minimum pressure that the diabetes neuropathy patient could feel was greater compared to the control subject. So it is telling us that the diabetes neuropathy patient have indeed impaired foot sensation. And when we look at the location effect of the vibration, when this was the baseline zero, and you can see that the best performance or the sensation improvement was found on soleus muscle when the vibration was applied on the away of the foot area. And in terms of the intensity effect, uh, we found that the 40% and 60% was more effective than the 80%. But this is just a research from only seven subjects. 
So, and imagine that we, I'm imagining in this, 20, 20 subjects, uh, 40 subjects uh, data is uh, collected and analyzed. We will eventually find out, uh, determine the optimal vibration intensity and location. Then the experiment two, uh, its goal is uh, to determine the efficacy of the optimal vibration on sensory motor function. So in experiment two, uh, the same subject will perform various sensory motor function uh, tasks as pretty much the similar uh, sensation tasks which we are performing in experiment one. And we, are, we added motor tasks, for example, the uh, ankle strengths and motor control and balance task and walking speed as well. Uh, additionally, we are going to measure the pain score as well with and without the optimal vibration. So from experiment two, we, are, we will be able to determine the effect of optimal vibration on sensation, motor function, and pain level. So I feel sad that I am not able to share a completed result of our study on today. Uh, but based on the research, uh, the, since the data collection is still going, uh, I hope I have another chance to give uh, further information of, uh, in the future. Uh, if, but if the optimal uh, vibration intensity and the location reserve is maintained, as I shared with you today, what does that mean? That's another thing I want to share. So that means the remote vibration away from the food can improve the sensation, uh, sensation uh, in the diabetic neuropathy patient. Therefore, the finding this. Uh, finding from this project will be an important foundation of knowledge for the future development of the portable uh, treatment uh, at home or in clinic uh, use for sensory loss associated with diabetes neuropathy. So this kind of setup might be available and uh, we may be able to develop the, the insole that are vibrating. Uh, it, keep producing the imperceptible vibration, but improve the sensation and motor function as well. So, of course, this project was funded, is funded by AgeWell. Thank you one more time. And this, uh, the project uh, won't be able to uh, accomplish this level uh, without these helpers like Dr. Jane Jacoby is the PI of the Healthy Exercise and Aging Lab and Kate Crosby and Jacob Mobor are two undergraduate students who helped me and who are keep helping me and they uh, who has a very bright future. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you very much, Chanky. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so you, there are a couple of comments here, a mm -hmm. couple of questions here from the audience. Great. But the first one, um, and I think you answered this a little bit, but I'll, I'll maybe build on it. There's um, a question about what are the real world applications of this research and possible <laughs> next steps? And related to that, I wanted to ask you, um, what, how long, you know, to do this, you talked about this is something that could be done at home for patients. Mm -hmm. What, um, what could you, can you describe a little bit more about the device and how long you would need to apply it for to see these kinds of benefits? Like, is it, is it, do you test immediately after um, and do these, does the sensation or does it need to be repeated over a series of days? Okay, that's those are two very good questions, and I think I don't think they are separated. Uh, so I will answer uh, the second question first about the device. Is it correct? Am I understanding correct? Sure. Yes. Right. So how long and how often can we apply th this technology 
is something we do not know still, which means does it have like a prolonged effect or not? That is another step of uh, studies that we need to go through after the effect of vibration on improving the sensation is determined or the found. So this is a very early stage. After we confirm, okay, the imperceptible vibration uh, is effective, then we next step will be like uh, uh, to see the longitudinal effect. And then the device development needs to be performed. So I think that should be the quest, uh, answer for the second one. And the real world application is something that I am looking for, but still we don't know. But there are several uh, studies going on, but not for the diabetes neuropathy, but uh, there are like, uh, I'm from South Korea and there is a, uh, there are some professors who are working on um, looking at pretty much a similar thing, but the healthy young adults as well, using the insole that are vibrating. But my, my fundamental question came from, nobody knows whether vibrating one spot on the food or away from food or multiple area on food, what is the best one? We don't know. So the real world application is still do not know. We do not know. However, the most important thing is if vibrate, vibrating away from the food area can improve the sensation in food, therefore it improves the mobility. That means like the picture I showed you, like a car, uh, we can place a carf like not a stocking but I, I i'm not familiar with the terms but any vibration technology that can, we can vibrate induce vibration on the carf can improve the mobility right so we are very far away from the real world application but you know i think the the finding from my study will give another evidence that we can step forward. And then another question, kind of two questions um, that are a bit related is, can you describe some of the barriers for adoption of this device? And did any of the participants give feedback on their comfort with using this device? So I think those questions are, are, are a bit related, if you can speak to that. Okay, the barrier and what was the second one? Sorry. Any barriers for adoption of this device? And did participants give any feedback on their comfort with this kind of device? Okay, so a yeah, very interesting question. Uh, starting from the second question, participants complain or something. Uh, so far, we only have like, I, even though I showed you seven participants, we uh, have recruited like nine or 10 and they are, we are analyzing right now, but thus far, uh, no one complained about the vibration or they did not say anything about, oh, this is, I feel weird or I don't feel good because think this way, that is imperceptible vibration. So the old participant, we uh, does not, they don't feel if, whether it is vibrating or not that so, so far, we did not have any complaints or any kinds of negative feedback about the, the, the type of the vibration. But, you know, that should be the another thing that we need to design. I mean, uh, focus on analyzing and in the near future study and for the barriers in device adaptation is something that I am always thinking uh, one because you know vibration needs a uh, power right electrical power so we need uh, batteries or something like that so 
insole is something that we can easily equip the battery not easily but you know relatively easier than the making a device on cart or ankle but you know that this technology is in the very initial stage so i really need uh, another input from the people who are familiar with or expert in device development as well and another uh, barrier i thought about was what if the best uh, vibration uh, location was an ankle you know anklet like a imagine that you are wearing a smart watch like device on ankle and you know that may induce some misunderstanding to the people yep great thanks very much chen ki mm -hmm. so we may have more questions for you um at the end of the uh session so for okay. now i will move on to um introduce our next speaker if there's no more new questions so thank, thank you. you very much mm -hmm. um so our next speaker today is erica dove from the university of toronto who's also with olive bryanton um so i'll start with introducing erica um erica's uh, currently pursuing a phd in rehabilitation sciences from the university of toronto under Dr. Arlene Estelle's supervision. Erica obtained her Bachelor of Health Sciences degree in kinesiology from Ontario Tech University in 2015, and her Master of Science degree in uh, Rehabilitation Sciences from the University of Toronto in 2021. Uh, broadly, Erica's research interests focus on the use of technology to support uh, physical, cognitive, and psychological health of older adults with a specific interest in using exercise uh, video games to improve functional outcomes among people with dementia. Erica has been working in this area of research since 2014. So welcome, Erica. And I'll also introduce Olive. Olive Bryanton um, joined the Age Well Older Adults and Caregiver Advisory Committee in 2018. As an educator and passionate advocate for older adults, Olive was instrumental in the establishment of the first multi-purpose senior center um, on PEI. She was also instrumental in establishment of the Seniors College, affiliated with the University of Prince Edward Island and served as the first president. In 2000, Olive received an honorary degree from the University of Prince Edward Island for her advocacy work with older adults and lifelong learning. In 2012, Olive was awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for her contributions to seniors provincially and federally, which is quite an honor. Um, in 2017, Olive was appointed by the Minister of Health and PEI to serve as an executive advisor for the development of the recent seniors health and wellness strategy for Prince Edward Island. She's currently, currently a lifelong learner and defended her PhD in 2018. So welcome to both of you, um, and I'll pass over the uh, screen sharing to you. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share my screen. Can you see my PowerPoint? <clears throat> yep. Yes. Okay, perfect. I'll start my timer. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Erica Dove, and uh, we've already been introduced, but I'm beyond pleased to be here with all of Bryanton today to talk to you about my PhD research, Balanced Rehabilitation for People with Dementia, Exports Informing, Extra Game Design. So just to start off with a little bit of background, um, so many of you, you're part of age well because you know that there are more older adults than ever. So there are actually more people over the age of 65 than there are under the age of 14. And you may also know if you're in this space that one of the biggest risk factors for developing dementia is age. So as people continue to age, there are going to be more people living with dementia. 
And people living with dementia and older adults are actually at an increased risk of falls compared to younger adults. And this could be partially due to impairments in different factors, but one of those would be postural balance. So for example, people become more unsteady or they are unable to focus as much when they're walking and talking, doing different things, for example. Um, they may need mobility aids and people's needs change over time. So where I come in and where all of I come in is that exercise and games can actually be combined into what I like to call exer games um, to deliver engaging exercises to older adults um, of varying conditions. So they've done research of healthy older adults, older adults with diabetes, um, people with mobility impairments, and also people living with dementia. However, one of the big challenges is that adherence to exercise is not particularly high among this population. And a lot of times what I hear when I speak to older adults and people with dementia is that current exercise programs aren't meeting their needs. So this is where extra games come in, but there's no extra games made really specifically for this population. So the purpose of my PhD is to co-design extra game to reduce falls risk among older adults with dementia through end user and stakeholder input. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I did. So back in January, just when uh, the pandemic had eased up, I went to some day programs with some video cameras and recorded participants while playing different existing extra game systems. So we tried out Nintendo Switch, Xbox Connect. Uh, we even tried out, as you can see up here on the left, uh, a skiing game by a company called Gintronics, where you shift your body weight from side to side to miss rocks as well as squat to go under obstacles. You can also see on the right participants playing a boxing game where they were looking at a connect sensor that was mapping out their skeleton and their goal was just to punch the other player on the screen. So I went to four community-based outdate programs and recruited 34 people with dementia and they played six sessions each at each day program so a total of 24 sessions with the different systems and what i did in this in just the video recording which i haven't analyzed yet is i also got their audio recorded feedback on what they liked and didn't like about the games and this was a really good learning experience for me because people with dementia are different than older adults in the sense that they give feedback differently so i found i had to ask different questions more yes or no questions more probing things like that so that was good to learn I also got input from stakeholders. So I conducted interviews with clinicians, um, so physiotherapists and occupational therapists, researchers interested in falls, risk, balance, and aging, game designers who have worked in the area of rehab, and older adults and caregivers. Um, so I actually conducted focus groups with caregivers just to get them more in a group setting. But everyone else, I conducted semi-structured interviews, 30 minutes each. And uh, I used their input to augment the user feedback that I got from the game testing sessions in order to better understand how I could create an extra game designed to impact falls risk among older adults. So for the end user feedback, the feedback I received when I brought up the game systems was surprisingly quite positive. So even though some of the games weren't as accessible as I thought they were, they really enjoyed them. So for example, even with my handicap in my right arm, I was able to do the right arm movements, which pleases me. So looking at it, it's an exercise I could use because my right arm isn't the best. It's still good enough to do minimal movement with this particular game. For me, it's something different instead of playing the same things over and over and over and over. That is brilliant what you've brought into here. For the stakeholder input, uh, when I was speaking, I got different input depending on the stakeholder group, which was really interesting because I got to see how multidisciplinary it is to actually build a game, which I'm happy to expand on later. For, so for the researcher, I actually interviewed someone who had developed a game and he was saying, we were thinking of a game that hopefully people remember from their youth so that it wouldn't be a big learning curve. Caregivers commented on the fact that aging presents many challenges, not just dementia. So I would say to be cognizant of not too much auditory stimulation if they're having to concentrate on something they're doing physically. You don't want bells and whistles going off probably at the same time as they're trying to concentrate because too much noise can drown out the thought process. And finally, 
clinicians didn't have a lot of experience with exer games, but saw the use for it and were able to give you some really interesting ideas about exercises to put into the games. <clears throat> I think there needs to be more virtual and digital stuff coming into therapy because that's where we're heading, right? So that's all well and good, but what's missing from this equation? I haven't done any interviews with older adults who are not living with dementia to more contextualize and comment on the idea and design process. And that is where I bring in Olive today. So we're going to have some live feedback with Olive. So I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen so you can see Olive and I. Let me just get, there we are. Perfect. Um, hi, Olive. Thanks for listening. Hi, Erica. Hi, Erica. So I have some questions for you. Um, I wonder, from your perspective, why might older adults want to use a video game for fall risk reduction? What, what was the question again? Why might older adults want to use a, uh, extra games for fall reduction, fall risk reduction? Well, I, no one wants to fall, uh, regardless of age, because, but as the, as you get older, of course, the end result can be much worse. Um, so I, I believe that older adults really do want to improve their functional ability and, um, Building on that function ability is, is, is amazing. And I think what would motivate older adults would be having a clear purpose as to why they would be using this extra, extra games and how would it benefit them. They didn't really know how it would benefit them and what, what's the possible time frame before they might experience some improvement. Um, they also have to have reasonable challenges um, and they, they need to see they're progressing. Like sometimes I, I hear older adults saying, you know, that the challenge they're given is probably childish and they, they need a real challenge. And they, I think if they have a bit of control themselves, if they, if they're doing a game and, and they feel they've completed one challenge, they can move forward. Uh, it's much better if it's coming from them as opposed to someone saying, now you've done this and so we'll move on because sometimes, because everyone's so very different, sometimes they're not ready to move on. But if they have a little bit of control, I think that's wonderful. That's a great perspective. And you kind of already touched on this, but what do you think would motivate older adults to use Xer games? Um, the, I think the the greatest motivators are are opportunities maybe to interact with others, uh, an opportunity to maybe challenge yourself. Uh, people. They say people are not competitive, but they are. They don't matter what age they are. They are competitive. So it's, it's the opportunity to be competitive with themselves or to have fun with others as they are doing the exercise program. And, and this is, I, I think, and having control. Those are the motivators for people. And, and something that is not... Uh, doesn't have too many bells and whistles. Uh, simple is much better. So uh, they they enjoy opportunities to participate, but they also would like sometimes to have some way to measure their their progress. Uh, knowing you're progressing is a really wonderful motivator. So. Uh, some way to celebrate every once in a while that you have achieved something. Excellent. Thank you. That's so insightful. I have more questions, but I think we're actually running out of time. So I'm going to pop my screen back up. Okay. Pop it back up, get the right screen going <clears throat> and move on. So now we're at the end. So what is next? So obviously I have just, I had like a two minute conversation with all of them. She just blew my mind with all of her great ideas and insights that I never even thought of. So now I know I need to go back to the drawing board and get more of that and talk to more end users and get more end user input. And I don't think that you know 
when you're building a product like I am, I don't think you really realize how important your end users are until you inter you start doing it. And then you're like, oh no, I need them for all these decisions. And they should really be part of your design team. So then I'm going to be going on to data analysis, prototyping, um, doing some interactive code development sessions with the prototype. And then once it's done, just pilot testing of the finished game to see whether it actually does reduce fall risk. So stay tuned for future Epic conferences. I will keep you posted, hopefully. And here are our references. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much to both of you. That was very interesting. And I love I love this area as uh, fall prevention is uh, an area that's near and dear to my heart too. So this is great. Um, one comment, one question we have already um, uh, is, Erica, do you have plans for the commercialization of Exer Games? Um, and how far away are you from this? I think that's a great question. I've always taken the approach to research that I don't, I don't think it's very helpful when you make something and it just sits on a, a shelf or it gets written up in a paper and it just sits there. I think it actually needs to be put into people's hands. What I'm trying to do for my PhD, just being honest because I'm on a four year timeline is I am developing one extra game, but what I hope to do is my overall program of research as I become a PI and run my own, own lab is I hope to actually create like a suite of extra games and actually have those as commercializable products that could be used in different settings, like long-term care homes. I am, I really value all this point about um, the importance of socialization. So it's something I see more as a group activity. So long-term care homes, day programs, senior centers, um, schools, like it could be put anywhere if it's in a group setting. So really the possibilities are endless. And I see we've got a question for all of us. I'll let you go, Marla. Mm -hmm. So Olive, um, can you speak to the value of working with researchers on projects like this? What is the value um, to you? Well, I, I think it's um, when any time we're developing something uh, or providing a program, we really need to talk to the end user to find out what they really want. Um, I, I know in developing technology, people get very excited about what they're doing. And if they forget about the end user, then it is, it, they could develop it and it could be lovely for a younger person, but it would not work for an older person. Um, it's, uh, I, I think working with the younger generation is really exciting. I, I love working with younger generations because they are so full of enthusiasm and ideas. And, and sometimes it takes the older adult to bring them back down to earth again. And, and the end product is really much better. So I love doing it. Great. I was, I was very I'm, um, struck by one of the, oh, sorry, I'm see, I see another question, so I better stick to that before I ask my own. Um, so someone's commented here that you, uh, great presentation, and, and could you comment on the reported motion sickness or other barriers when play testing the Exer game? Absolutely. Hi, Samira. Uh, sorry, we know each other. She's oh. in the, the VR world. So we're all part of the same world. So I, I didn't have, um, so it's interesting. I used, so I used different systems. So I used some controller based systems like the Nintendo Wii and the Nintendo Switch, which has the gyroscope technology. So you actually have to hold the controller, move it, and that's what creates the movement on the screen. That was really challenging for participants to use because they were confused about the buttons and kind of, okay, well, which button do I press? And when I kind of tried to explain to them, don't press any buttons, just move it, they weren't, they didn't, it didn't really click. Um, there's also, I've read research articles with handheld controllers just about things like age, like manual dexterity, fine motor skills, grip strength, all these things decline with age. So it becomes harder to hold on to these sort of devices. There's actually a research study where they had to cover most of the Wii controller with like a thermoplastic splint to block all the buttons. With the Kinect, uh, which is a camera-based system, I didn't have any motion sickness, any challenges. Um, it even picked up people actually who use wheelchairs, which I thought was really important. Um, there was a one game that was a camera-based game on a laptop, which was the skiing game I had the picture of. Someone did comment that after watching the skier 
for playing for like a, quite a while. They did get a little bit nauseous. But other than that, there were no real adverse side effects to the games. I've never tried VR, and I know that it's an emerging area, but it's not something that I have the expertise to comment on. Okay, great. I thought um, one really interesting point that Olive made was about wanting to make sure that the challenges are not, um, you know, childish, or you know, we don't kind of we don't want to infant. In Oh, I, I want to say the word infantilize. Inf I can't even. Say. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Yeah, you yeah. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think I think that's really really important. And and um, I have a background in physiotherapy. I used to work clinically with older people all the time. And and I think it is really important that we choose tasks um, and that are really that that you know respect the the individual. Um, and so, you know, how did that play into sort of what you chose as the topic for your for your game? Um, it's a it's a skiing game, right? Um, um, so the skiing game yeah. was just one of the games we played. The actual okay. concept hasn't been solidified yet. Um, what I do know is that people from the interviews I did with the people with dementia and also the other stakeholders is they really value games that have like a reminiscence element. So, for example, we played a few bowling sports and bowling games and people really liked those because one person used to be a pin boy as a teenager. So he was like, this is great. It reminds me of being a teenager. And then uh, someone else was like, oh, I used to play softball. So I love this baseball game. And, you know, I've never gone skiing. I've, I, you know, I haven't been skiing in 20 years to be able to do this. So and it's also they really enjoyed games that like all this had fostered that group community so where people could actually cheer each other on get into a little bit of friendly competition people are competitive i'm competitive i think we're all inside we're not only competitive with others but we're competitive with ourselves so like i think all this point again about progression and saying okay i'm doing this thing am i actually getting better at it and am i actually seeing results how long till i see results i think those are all great questions that i need to have answers to if i'm going to be you know pitching a product so I definitely got my work cut out for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great feedback for sure. I think um, the value of providing ongoing feedback to older people as they're progressing through an intervention is really, really important. How can we do that and how we can do it simply? So mm -hmm. they're great thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll we'll have more questions. I don't not seen anything else right now. Um, oh, there is one question here about um, did you experience any unexpected challenges in the co-design process? That's a great question. So unexpected challenges, I would say, is just the more people, and this is something, like, this is a PhD, so I'm learning, right? And that's what I'm here to do is I love learning. That's why I did a PhD. And I find the more people I speak to, the more opinions you get. And I think that's the thing you have to know about if you're going to do something that's truly transdisciplinary is you are going to have that physio perspective and then i didn't realize i had just said okay i'm going to interview clinicians but when i went to do that it actually had such different interactions with physiotherapists versus occupational therapists and what they thought was important to include in the game so i think that was a not a challenge but just a bit of a it took me back a bit to be like, okay, I have to i'm trying to satisfy all these different groups and create something that's going to satisfy everybody and I haven't got there yet. This is why I'm still collecting data and it's still ongoing. I am leaning towards something that the people will, will really like, but has some of the physio exercises integrated and has the OT element of connecting to a real life task and game design elements of, you know, immersivity and flow and trying to satisfy everybody. I think it's a true challenge that we're all trying to do here at AgeWell. Great, thank you. Um, so what I think we'll save, we have one other question, but we'll save it for the final question okay. and answer. And we'll, we'll chat about that, um, a little bit later. Um, and so let's move on now to, um, our talk from Bree's mobility. And I think I'm just trying to. Uh, Hi. Okay. Allison here from AgeWell. Um, so I'm going to bring Terrence up and um, also introduce him. So he was able to join us at the last minute today. Um, so Terrence Ho is uh, joining us from Braze. So he's the head of partner success 
Um, Terrence is a son, brother, and caregiver. He held roles in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors where he's learned to advocate tirelessly for the greater good as a strategist, facilitator, excuse me, sorry, I'm trying to do things at once, as a strategist, facilitator, and community building. One of his biggest influences is his younger brother who lives with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Caring for his brother for almost 30 years has helped Terrence appreciate the unique needs of patients and caregivers. Terence has been inspired by these life experiences to become a change agent and advocate for accessibility, inclusion, and mental health. When he's not advocating for others and caregiving, you'll find him enjoying a podcast or jumping on his trampoline. So thanks for joining us today, Terence. Are you able to uh, share your screen? I will. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, so um, I'm the head of partner success at Braze Mobility. And just to give you an overview, um, so the company, our company, Braze Mobility, is based in Toronto, and it was founded in 2016 by Dr. Pooja Vishwanathan, um, who has incorporated over a decade of smart wheelchair research into the state of art technology that improves accessibility and independence for people with disabilities. And so I don't know if you know, but majority of powered mobility device users experience major collisions uh, resulting in property damage, wheelchair damage, and injuries that can lead to hospitalization. And in many cases, accidents like these can lead to exclusion from the use of powered mobility devices altogether, even when no other option for independent mobility exists. And so to address this issue, we at Braze Mobility uh, created the first world's first blind spot sensors that can be added to any wheelchair and transforming into a smart wheelchair. And the technology automatically detects obstacles and provides feedback to the user through intuitive lights, sounds, and vibrations. Uh, my brother, back in the early days, was actually an early beta test uh, uh, user uh, of, of the system. Uh, so I'm going to now show a few videos to describe our product. Just one second here. Oh, here we go. We're not hearing the audio, Terrence. Oh, you're not? Is there a way to share sound too? Yes, you should be able to share. Um, if you close again, just make sure that you share um, audio sound. There should be a button um, when you're on the share page there. If you're in the window, if you share the window and then you scroll down, it will say share audio. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Let's try this again. Take two. Two years ago on Christmas Eve, now. literally they dropped this wheelchair off to me. Within hours of me getting in this place, I had pretty much destroyed my apartment. Done a lot of damage in my house and on my furniture and knocked a lot of things over unintentionally. And after a while, you just start ignoring it because you're either constantly frustrated with the damage you do and so now it's kind of like two or three dents in the wall a day is just normal. Hi everyone, my name is Pooja Vishwanathan and I'm the CEO and founder of Braze Mobility. We build innovative solutions to help increase safe and independent mobility. I've been doing research on smart wheelchairs, which is where robotics meets assistive technologies for over 14 years. In the last few years at Braze, we've collaborated with several therapists, wheelchair users and their families to come up with the Braze blind spot sensors. These sensors are low cost and can be added to any wheelchair to automatically detect obstacles and provide multimodal feedback to the user. This feedback comes in the form of intuitive light, sounds, and vibrations. Let me show you how this works. So what I have here is the Sentinel. It's 180 degrees of horizontal coverage and about 45 to 50 degrees of vertical coverage. So this is the controller that displays all of the visual feedback that the system provides. 
the blue light tells us that the system is on and that it's in the first mode, which we call the short range mode. Now in short range mode, the sensors detect obstacles in the warning zone within two feet, displaying a yellow light, and in the danger zone within a foot, displaying a red light. If I press down on the big red button, I can switch to the long range mode indicated by two blue lights. Now the sensors detect obstacles in the warning zone within four feet and in the danger zone within two feet. So that's double the distances of the short range mode. Please of course note that all of these distances are customizable, but what I'm showing you right now is just the default values and the detection distances. Now I want to show you the audio feedback. So I'm going to turn on the audio switch, which is done by just simply pushing that button from the top. And now when I come in, you're going to hear a beep as we enter the danger zone. Now note that the audio only beeps when we're in the danger zone and not in the warning zone. We did this just to prevent um, annoyance or, uh, from excessive beeping. Now, lastly, we have... Um, vibration feedback. So what I'm holding in my hand here is a vibration module that can be inserted in the backrests or the armrests or the seat cushions. We can have up to three vibration modules that plug right into the bottom of this unit. And what the vibration module does is very similar to the visual feedback. You receive vibrations when an object is on the left, the middle, or the right. And here's what our customers have to say about our technology have a device back there that is literally watching my back it is an amazing feeling when we added this sensor unit to the chair it was just amazing to it gives you an alert before you hit something because you don't do it intentionally i think that anyone who's using a power chair um, would benefit from the situation and there's even situations where it might be beneficial to someone in a manual chair or even someone who's just uh has issues looking behind them I was a Marine for four years and contracted Agent Orange in Vietnam and uh, lost both my legs above the knees. And then a few years ago, I started losing my eyesight. And that's been the biggest challenge of everything I've gone through. But with the Sutna device mounted on my wheelchair, it's really made life easier for me. And uh, safer. It just, it just all over. Uh, it gives you a sense of security and less anxiety because you know that it'll let you know if there's something or someone or a child in the way, and you don't have to worry about hurting someone. Today, our product is impacting hundreds of lives but there are still millions of users out there who can benefit from this technology. As we continue to serve our customers, we're also developing new features, such as automatically correcting speed for users who are unable to respond to prompts alone. In fact, we recently won the OT Inventors Showcase at the AOTA for this technology. Please contact us for more information so we can help you and your clients navigate boldly, independently, and safely. So that was an intro on our product. Now I'm going to show you a second video where one of our uh, clients who actually you saw in this first video, uh, how he navigates tight spaces using our product. Usually when I uh, come into my kitchen, um, I have uh, extreme problems as it is. It's a tight space. It was never designed for a wheelchair, but um, being in a wheelchair and being that I like to cook, I have to come into my kitchen and doing so, so as you can see, it's a very tight space and having the drive in leaves me no alternative but to drive out and back out. As I'm backing out, it is impossible for me to be able to see the doorway behind me and to see the handle that is on this fridge, which by include back on. 
But with the device, I don't even have to look behind me or try to look. I just look at the light system, which right now is giving me three green lights, and as well the vibrating pads that are in my back are telling me as I back up, if I am in the center of the doorway, as long as none of these lights turn red, I know that I am centered and I am not going to hit anything. As well, there's vibrating pads in my back. If I am looking straight ahead and not at the lights, if I'm carrying something or as I'm coming out, it will warn me. So if one of the pads, if the left one goes off, I know I'm about to tear the handle off my fridge. If the right one goes off, I know I'm about to hit this doorway, which already has no paint left on it. And so as the lights stay green, I back out. And as you can see, I am not hitting anything. I am coming straight out through the door. And even though that is such a tight space, I've made it without touching or damaging anything. Dr. Gundry. So yeah, that's, those are the two videos I'll show you. Do we have any questions? And we also have a special guest because Pooja is actually here too. <laughs> Hey, hi, thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation um, and for sharing with us a little bit about your technology. One, one question here we have um, is you mentioned having beta testers, but were end users, um, did you involve any end users in, in the initial design and brainstorming of the technology? Yeah, um, all of the beta testers were wheelchair users. So we, we, we don't, uh, we don't think it's a representative for someone who's not a wheelchair user to test the system. So we're very particular about end users um, actually testing our system, and giving us feedback. Uh, and that's actually, you know, we, we iterated several times during our beta test program. In fact, we got um, pretty cool feedback from our, our users to the point where we changed several design uh, pretty big, um, made some pretty big design changes as a result of their feedback. In fact, we had a, a couple of our users that were, um, you know, that were designers kind of themselves and were actually able to iterate with us and, and provide feedback. So that was a great experience for us as well. That's great. Um, what's the cost of this kind of a device and, and how would you go about purchasing something like this? Yep. Yeah, so our, um, if, if anyone's interested, the pricing actually does range depending on what the client needs are. And so the best thing would be to um, submit a on our website. So if you go to our webpage, www.braysmobility.com, um, we can provide a link right here. Uh, then you can fill out, um, if you go to request a demo or a quote, you can fill out your information and then we'll provide pricing information. But it is a range because you can get anywhere from um, uh, just targeted coverage with a couple of smaller sensors, all the way to sensors in the front and the rear and on the side, kind of like a whole 360. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a pretty big range there, but we tend to match um, our configuration to client needs specifically. Great. Um, and what about, is, is your system capable of detecting uh, windows or stairs going down? Uh, windows, yes, but not uh, not drop-offs. The current, um, the current system that's available commercially does not detect drop-offs, but we are actually uh, in the middle of a pretty big collaboration with the United States uh, Department of Veterans Affairs to mm. uh, to currently actually design system that would be capable of drop offs and more sort of outdoor navigation and 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 actually understanding what some of those accessibility barriers are in in outdoor spaces. Great. Um, and and then what about is there an option where the chair you know how they have um, technology for cars and things where the car will actually stop if it comes too close to something do you have um, are you working on technology like that or does your technology offer that yeah and I it might have showed up in that five minute video um, overview but we do have a system that will slow down the chair and stop as well. It is not something that we are making widely commercially available, uh, mainly because um, you know we have to understand that the clientele that we're working with is not the same clientele as those driving Teslas, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't have a five-year-old driving a Tesla or someone with significant cognitive or you know and potentially even vision deficits. So. 
um, we have to be a lot more careful about our, you know, what we take into consideration with what our clients are are capable of. Would they be able to, for example, identify if a malfunction happens or how they would override? Um, and we've seen a lot of these safety issues even come up in the automotive industry. It's just we have to be so much more careful in our space because of the potential, you know, dire consequences and for our specific clientele. And so it's certainly something that we have continued to work on and we're, we'll, we're, we're still gonna um, keep pushing the envelope on that technology, but we are now also getting involved with um, some of the standards, uh, safety standards and actually creating new standards because they don't actually exist um, for that sort of technology in our space. And so our um, very recently we've gotten involved with Resna on a standards committee that's specifically going to be discussing uh, what those standards might look like for this sort of technology and what the implications might be for our clientele. Yeah, that's very important. Um, one of the comments here is that, um, you know, this technology might be something that really um, is helpful for patients in long-term care. But like you said, um, a lot of these uh, standard, like, you know, a lot of things would probably need to be very carefully considered. Absolutely. And I, I think where we, uh, right now, the way we uh, present um, in terms of who is the appropriate clientele for this is we're not currently looking at clientele that is unsafe, that would be deemed unsafe to drive a power chair. However, we do find a lot of cases of clients who are capable of driving but are unduly excluded, um, you know, maybe because they have blind spots around their chair. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there there's no real practical way to be able to put in, uh, install mirrors on a wheelchair because you put them on the sides and they just get end up, you know, end up getting knocked up uh, going through doorways and stuff. And so while we don't turn a bad driver into a good driver, we certainly do help prevent undue ex exclusion and have actually had long term care facilities where our sensors have been mandated and where clients who would have otherwise might have lost their device unfairly have actually managed to keep their mobility devices for longer and others who uh, were not even being considered simply because of a diagnosis um, were actually um, trialed with our sensors and with the with the wheelchair and were deemed to be able to drive safely and actually managed to get access to power mobility. And so that's really where we're opening the doors right now. Mm -hmm. And in the longer term, of course, the goal would be to really create opportunities for everyone, regardless of their ability. Thank you. That's great. Um, so now I think what I'd like to do is we'll have the general question and answer and discussion period. So we'll invite back up to the screen um, Chang He, uh, Erica, and Olive. Great. So now we can take general questions for um, anyone here. There is uh, one question here that was already designated for the final question and answer. Um, and I think this question was for Erica. Uh, do you think it's possible to use some of these obtained results of um, EXER games to develop a fall risk assessment tool or method for older adults with different uh, types of dementia? There, I almost spoke when I was muted, but I didn't. Ha, huh. sorry. Um, I think I love that question. I think that definitely, especially with the camera-based sensors, like the connect where it maps out your entire skeleton, it definitely can perform. So what I've done, what I did for my master's at least, was I actually did, did an intervention study using a bowling game. And what, it, what I noticed was that there were components of the bowling game, just like standing up, rising from a chair, and walking to a line that are part of balance assessments, like the bird balance scale or other assessments. So I, I, you can actually integrate pieces of assessments into games. I think there's definitely a way that you can make a game into a fall risk assessment. Even one of the games I tried that was a rehab-based game, you had to perform an assessment before you actually played the game so that it could calibrate how difficult to make things. Um, I think also um, different types of dementia. I really, I saw your question and I was like, oh, that's a good question. And I started researching really quickly on the internet, different types of gait and dementia and types of dementia. I know that um, there has been some research talking about how different types of dementia can be differentiated using measures of gait analysis. So for example, somebody who has Parkinson's disease might walk differently than somebody who's got Alzheimer's disease, for example. It's really premature area of research though. So there's not a lot of work on it. And I'm definitely not a neuroscientist. I can't 
comment on that so much. I hope that answers your question. There was another question here about how um, we can access different games that are suitable for research, for future research. That's a good question. I will answer that question with a little bit of a plug. Uh, my supervisor has a website called www.actodementia.com, A-C-T-O dementia.com. And what it does is it recommends apps that have been put through an evidence-based framework and have been um, confirmed to be accessible for people living with dementia. So this is touchscreen apps and I envision creating a platform that's just like that, but for extra games. So when I get there, I will definitely be uploading the extra games and people can download them and actually use them. That's my hope at least. So I'm not there yet, but I hope to get there. I will definitely be making a repository and some sort of evaluation framework so that people can take games that are already out there and say, hey, is this suitable for my aunt, you know, and go through a quick checklist and say, oh, it's not because of mm -hmm. it's got flashing lights while there's music going off while there's fast and fine motor movements and it's not going to work. Great. Thanks. Um, there was another question. I think this was for um, Terrence and Bree's uh, mobility. Um, have you investigated if this device is working correctly when it's storming? So when there are weather conditions? Yeah, we, we have done a lot of testing with, um, you know, being in, based in Toronto, we get a lot of extreme uh, temperatures here and rain and snow and all of that. And so our, our beta program uh, did include a lot of this testing so that wheelchair users are actually using it in the kind of conditions that they would typically be driving their chairs. Uh, what we generally find though, is if there is a, a major downpour, people are usually not out in their power wheelchairs because the power wheelchairs themselves are not waterproof. <laughs> so, um, so that hope, hopefully that answers the question. But yes, we did do. Um, we we had actually a one of our beta clients who sent me a picture of him using the sensors uh, while he was shoveling his dro driveway after a snowstorm. So that was interesting. That's great. Great. Um, another question for Erica about: Do um, our patients that use walkers are they able to participate? Yes. So they are. They are walkers. Um, and then I hope to also even though I want to design a game that's for fall risk, it would be great if I'm doing something that's for a community base to be also able to include people who use wheelchairs like in the upper body sense, but definitely people with canes, walkers, and no devices can participate. Great. Great. I had uh, one question. There's a general question here that, that I'll get to, but I had one question for Chanky about um about how you know how does this subclinical or subspecialed vibration how does that bring about motor changes um like so so you you showed a slide where um this this kinds of vibration resulted in improvements in grip strength for example and you have plans to do some some kind similar sort of physical testing yourself how how what's the mechanism behind that yeah, that's a question that I expected, and thanks for asking the question. So the underlying mechanism of the improved the motor performance using the vibration, uh, especially the imperceptible vibration, is called stochastic resonance. So for example, this is the threshold of diabetes neuropathy patient and healthy older adult. Due to the diabetic neuropathy, their threshold is increased, which means they need more pressure or stimulation so that they can fill it. So what stochastic resonance does is it is just adding some more additional noise upon the stimulation that when, mm, when something is poking you, which means uh, with the pure uh, signal or stimulation, it cannot reach to the threshold, but when additional noise is added, it helps the signal reach to the threshold. So that's the underlying mechanism of uh, the improving the sensation. And there are many studies improving sensation, increased the walking speed and balance ability and reduces the what is that risk of falls so everything is related to the sensation improvement that induces mobility uh, improvement 
of it. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so now a question just for, for everyone here. Can you tell us about your experience working with stakeholders and what impact this has had on your research? Hey, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'd say a stakeholder engagement was actually critical for us to even enter the market and, and do what we do. Uh, I think health tech um, in itself is fairly complex in that it typically has a lot of stakeholders and the industry we operating uh, complex rat rehab technology is actually even more complex. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's a whole lot of stakeholders. We had to get buy in from um, you know, the, the end users and their families, oftentimes the families are sometimes making the ones making the decision. Um, the therapists, the clinicians are, are very much the gatekeepers of, of technologies in our case. Uh, and then the dealers who, um, so we, we work with wheelchair providers who then provide the wheelchair accessories as well. And, you know, they have a whole system set up and, you know, you have to meet certain requirements in terms of making sure that they're getting their margins because we actually do require them to provide not only installation and support, but also we use them to tap into um, state funding in the US, like the Medicare, Medicaid uh, funding, for example, you have to be a durable medical equipment provider to be able to um, apply for funding. And so we work with them to do all of that. And so we had to kind of structure our entire go-to-market strategy with all of these stakeholders in mind to make sure that we were checking off the boxes for all of them. Otherwise, even if one of them uh, you know, we didn't have buy-in from. Basically, we didn't have a we didn't have a business model. So it it has been incredibly critical, and I think a lot of those early discussions have really paid off because um, we have some fantastic collaborations and partnerships. Uh, we have some very strong channel partners in both the U.S. and Canada. Now we're starting to also work with the wheelchair manufacturers themselves to 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 have our sensors actually installed. Uh, on the chair so that people can purchase them with the sensors already built in. So that's a huge step for us. And those are the sorts of discussions that are happening. We already have that sort of partnership in Canada now with Sunrise Medical, uh, which is one of the leading wheelchair manufacturers. Um, so these are, this has all been great. And I think uh, another collaboration that I'm really excited about is the one that I mentioned with the Veterans Affairs in the US. Uh, you know, that collaboration is a really, really unique example of, you know, the VA, so there's, you know, a, a massive government organization working with a, a smaller you know tech startup like us and we've also brought in some established wheelchair manufacturers to be part of the collaboration and we're of course working with the VA staff and veterans as well so a very very unique collaboration that I think has been seen very rarely in our space um, and it's it's something that I'm very passionate about you know having a transdisciplinary background myself. Uh, that's the piece that I want to be able to contribute to complex rehab is actually breaking those silos and bringing in the private and public sectors to work together. Excellent. Uh, does anyone else want to add to that about their experience working with stakeholders and, and impact on, on their research? Was with, that was a... Uh... Yeah, I'd love to add to that. I'd actually love to build on... Um... Pooja's statement of just how important and critical and critical stakeholders are to the whole process. I think for me, just because I'm not as far along, I'm still a student. So I find that I learn a lot from the stakeholders and it, it reminds me, like Pooja said, that I want to break down those silos and I want to collaborate and, and be sort of like a jack of all trades. I want a little of this and a little of that. I want all the knowledge. I know that one person can't have all the knowledge and that's why you need other people to bring them in. And even I think what I've been doing now, as I come close to starting to develop the first iteration of the game, as I start to think to myself, well, wait, have I done enough end user engagement? Have I engaged with enough stakeholders? And I think the answer that I've come to the conclusion of is no. And I think if that's okay, I think it's okay to iteratively have your idea, even if it's just on a piece of paper, working with stakeholders is so important. And at the end of the day, that's who you're designing for. So if you're making an idea that they don't want, if no one wants an extra game for falls prevention, then you've got a big problem. Me too. Um, any comments, Chanky or Olive, to add to the, this discussion? Can I add one thing? Please. Okay, sorry, maybe all of Oh, almost. 
Yeah, I, I think it's so important to work with the the end users. Um, what you're doing is you're you're helping you're you're actually helping people empower themselves by working with them to design and and working with them to uh, make decisions. You're really empowering the older adults themselves and that is so very important and thank you for that thank you all right the thing that i want to add is you know i i think i'm just a complete learner in this conversation because my study is more like a physiology study and there are like a lot of more steps uh that i need to move on to uh really produce the finer product and user product so like so just one thing that I wanted to add is I didn't have any chance to deal with the stakeholder or the end user, even a pilot device. So thanks for all the information that you guys are sharing today. Thank you. Hopefully it can help you think of next steps, Chenki. That's great. Okay, well, I think um, I'm not seeing any more questions and we're getting close to time. So. I just wanted to thank everyone again so much for this really interesting discussion um, and a great presentations, lots and lots of um, exciting things going on in this space and how can we you know, improve and, and optimize the mobility of older adults and those living with multiple different conditions. So really, really great, um, exciting applications of technology today that we saw. Um, so, uh, I just, I'll just say goodbye and I'm not sure if there's anything else to say from age well's perspective. I think we will just, um, end the broadcast and, uh, hopefully you'll keep tuning in the rest of the week. So thanks very much to everyone and have a great afternoon.